right. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today, Greg. Um, yeah. You are great to meet. Iowa City. That's pretty far away from Westlake, Ohio. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You've got quite um, experience in tiny home living, and I'm um, very interested to hear about it because uh, my students in, in this class, uh, they've been working on a tiny home project. Um, either a 100 to 400 square foot design or a 400 to 850 square foot design and they're finding it kind of challenging so i bet trying to get it all to fit in there right your insight will be very helpful and um i'll let you introduce yourself and um go for it thank you so much for being here today yeah you're welcome greetings from iowa city and i'm not sure if if the class realizes but this most recent, what's referred to as the small house movement, um, I think many people consider that it began in Iowa City back in the year 2000. And um, so I'm here in the city where this all kind of got started. There was a professor at the University of Iowa named Jay Schaefer who was teaching and living in a house that looked like a garden shed on wheels. And that ended up being such a novelty that there was a newspaper article written about it. I saw that article and um, eventually got in touch with this professor. And after some discussion, the two of us and a couple of other people we were talking decided that there should be a small house society, you know, some kind of organization promoting these tiny houses. And here we are, you know, 15 years later, and it's just kind of grown and grown, and the movement's kind of grown. and. Um, Initially, I'm going to go ahead and bring up a presentation and I'll try to click on through it and that way um, we can have some discussion points as well, but I, I think it'll help to have the visuals. So, can you see my screen okay now? Yes, we can. Okay. And you're recording at your end, right? I am, yes. Okay. I have video just of myself and then of the PowerPoint presentation. so. If you want, it'll be available online. I thought that would be helpful. Um, so I'm going to jump into the slideshow. So on that first slide, what you're seeing is the house that I lived in from 2003 to 2009. So for six years, lived in a 10 by 7 house. And my initial thought on building so small was I wanted something that wouldn't cost a lot. I wanted something that I could almost build myself, although I, I used, um, Jay Schaefer was the person who really helped design and build it. I was just kind of an apprentice and helping along the way. Um, and I just thought it'd be interesting to kind of be like camping out in this cabin, essentially. Well, little did I know back in you know 2003 that there would be a growing interest in these tiny houses. So I become Jay Schaefer's first customer and then there have been many since then, but um, you know, at, at first there was like a local paper that reached out, and so they wanted to write an article about it, and then um, kind of regional news caught on to it, and then uh, pretty soon it just kind of took off, and I was surprised, because you know, it's such a tiny house, I thought there can't be many people who'd be seriously interested in living in such a small house. So 10 by seven, that's um, like 70 square feet, right? But then. You could consider the loft area in the peak of the roof there. That could be considered a floor. Now, in traditional architecture, you only count livable space where you can stand up. So, you know, some people would not consider that living space. But let's say it's 140 square feet. That's pretty tiny. So it was enough to get a lot of attention because it was so kind of absurd, you know. Um, so there was a lot of media attention. A lot of people wanted to see it. And it was a phenomenon. But at the same time, while it generated the interest, I didn't get a lot of people saying, oh yeah, garden shed, I'd love to do that. You know, So it was like too small for most people. Um, and I can understand that, You know, didn't have a shower, didn't have a bathroom, didn't have a normal sized kitchen. There wasn't like a big table that four people could sit down at and eat. It was really just like the most minimalist small space that an individual could live in. Um, and there's another picture of it to give you a little more of the dimensions. I'm there uh, on the porch with my wife and she and I now live still in Iowa City, but we wanted to live in a certain location in Iowa City where there is you know, easy access to bus routes and bicycle trails and a lot of things. And 
the locations we found where we could legally build the tiny house, um, those were pretty far away. So we have to both have a car to drive that would have increased our living expenses. And actually, ironically, if we were to choose to live in a small space legally, um, it would have a really adverse impact on the environment because we would end up driving everywhere. Because you can't really have these in Iowa City, you can't have them in most towns. If it's a home that's 200 square feet, 300 square feet, 400 square feet, those um, just are not permitted unless you get some kind of variance. Or if you live in a town like Portland, Oregon, where the, the city, the law in the city says, yeah, tiny houses are great. Go ahead and put one in your yard, that's fine. In general though, you can't do it. So you might be wondering, well then how did you live in Iowa City near the, the law school at the University of Iowa? And how did you live there for six years and not get evicted? Well, the city knew about this project. They knew what I was doing and they said, you know, you're not really supposed to do it, but we're not really gonna do anything about it, so go ahead. So I was, it was like this like precarious position where I thought, okay, this is fun, I'm enjoying it, but I don't wanna push my luck and all it takes is like some new person to get hired on at the city and then suddenly I'm getting evicted. You know, so I was like, and I didn't wanna be recommending it for other people like, hey, this is great, you should try it and then they invest a bunch of time and money and then they get evicted. So I, I ended up, um, in the interim for now, we're, we're living in an apartment, which is where I'm talking to you at right now. I'm gonna give you, um, a bit of a, a background, oh, just, I guess, some context, too, as far as, like, prior to living in that tiny house in 2003, for two years, I lived in a 10 by 12 room, like many thousands of other students in Iowa City at the university, you know, you have grad students and undergrads, people living in dorms, people renting a room in a house, and then you split the rent with other people, so it's not unusual to live in a 10 by 12 foot room, um, but Interestingly, while that is perfectly legal to rent a room like that, it isn't legal to buy one and own one and to like have a house of that size. They said, well, that's impossible. You can't have a house that's 10 by 12. That just wouldn't be realistic. So it's like, yeah, landowners can rent out these tiny rooms, but you can't like own one. Anyway, that's a separate story. But so I've, I've lived in tiny apartments. Um, even the, here where I'm at now is an apartment where I have a business. There's an office space, so that's not really part of the living space. It's for tax purposes, it's considered a, a business. Um, so the actual living space here, you start with a thousand, but the actual space we're using is maybe 700 square feet. So when I talk about context, what I mean is, how did how did I even get interested in tiny houses? How did most people get interested? Well, uh, I list a few points here, books, um, play, vacation, and then of course meeting Jay Shea, or so. As far as books, like every book I can remember when I was a kid was like, um, most stories had some kind of a cabin or a house. Those were like central to the story, whether it was Winnie the Pooh or whatever, Three Little Pigs, The Three Bears, you know. There's always some, you know, cabin in the woods and it's really cool. So uh, growing up, that was the impression I had of tiny houses. And then even, you know, when I was younger, I would build forts and tree houses and I had an interest in those. So I think we've all had those experiences of being exposed to some concept of tiny houses as a cool thing. And then even, you know, on vacation, going to cabins or cottages by the lake in the mountains, um, going to a hotel where the room is kind of sparse and small. So after numerous experiences like that, you start to think, well, if I'm paying money and like the most enjoyable thing I can think of for my two week vacation once a year is to go live in a small space, why don't I just do that year round, you know? so. Um, and, and then meeting Jay and seeing his house, I thought, yeah, this is it, this is the way to go. So uh, I had, uh, in 2003, had Jay build the house, I helped him build that, that summer, it took a couple months to build it. I wrote a book about it, you can see there, put your life on a diet, and the idea was, you know, taking as much stuff out of your life as possible that isn't necessary. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, continued over the past 15 years to facilitate to kind of oversee this small house society and help that movement grow. There's a picture through the front door of me cooking on a little camp stove that would sit nicely on top of this fold out table. So that's one thing you learn in a small space, whether it's an RV, camper type of situation, or a tiny house, um, or even a, an efficiency condo or whatever, you wanna have spaces that can be used for, for multiple functions. There is an apartment building really nice new modern apartment building here in Iowa City, 
that has like no walls and really kind of no furniture in a way. And, and what I mean is like, there are all these apartments, but you can slide these objects around. So the living room can become a dining room, can become a bedroom, like everything's on wheels. So this whole apartment can kind of morph into whatever you want it to be. Um, and in fact, I'll just mention, you know, other new construction in Iowa City features really expensive, like half a million dollar condos that are 500 square feet, 600 square feet. So smaller spaces are really becoming a trend. Um, and I think it's not just a change in mindset, but if you think about it, like show of hands, how many people have a smartphone? Yeah, like everybody, right? So, and keep your hands up if you have also like a tablet, an iPad or something. Yep. And then a desktop or laptop computer. Yeah. So you probably won't remember this, but there was a time when there would be in a home, you'd have like filing cabinets with all kinds of paper in them. And that would be like your telephone bill, your electric bill, your bank statement, uh, correspondence, like there'd be papers all over the place. And then you'd, you'd have like a whole room that was an office filled with papers. And then there would be like an entertainment room and you'd have this big TV that wasn't a flat screen, it was like this big box. And, um, and then you'd have to watch these videotapes. So there'd be bookshelves and bookshelves of videotapes. And the point I'm making here is that record albums, you probably know about those, you know, record albums, CDs, cassette tapes, videotapes, all this technology, uh, old old technology, can now fit in your smartphone, in your shirt pocket. So it's not that people just decided like, oh, I don't need space. They realized they really didn't need space. Like, where's your stuff? Your stuff is mostly digital, like your pictures, your audio, your books, your magazines, your emails. Most of that stuff's digital, can fit in your pocket. So um, it's less of a sacrifice today to say, hey, I'm gonna live without a whole bunch of junk around because there's really very little junk stuff that you actually need these days. Uh, so that's the point I like to make is that technology is really downsizing our lives. So then over those years from 2003 to 2009, the interest in this just kept growing. We would hear from you know people that would want to come and do an interview or look at this tiny house. Oh, and the funny thing was, I don't know if it's on this list, but it, it made it in Better Homes and Gardens. It was like featured in Better Homes and Gardens, which I thought was really funny because it's Usually Better Homes and Gardens has like these really fancy homes, you know. So here's this like garden shed basically. But a lot of lot of media interest, which was really helpful because that kind of makes things go mainstream, you know, and uh, provided a lot of exposure. So people ask though, what are the challenges of living small? And as you've been going through in your class, you know, trying to figure out what stuff do you keep? What stuff do you have? What stuff do you really need? Um, if you do like a little inventory of what's everything you have and then kind of scratch off the things you think you could do without. Now what I did was I took everything I had, I put it in storage, and then the first apartment that I moved into that was really small was like 14 feet by 12 feet. So still pretty small that one was. And, um, and then I started going to storage and bringing, okay, what are the things I need like for today or for this week? So I had like my stereo system, my computer, but really not that much stuff, maybe a, a couple dozen items, toothbrush, you know, and um, and then if I thought of something else, I knew what was in storage. So there wasn't this panic or pressure of thinking, oh, I've got to throw everything in the dumpster. It's like, oh, if I need something, it's in storage. Then pretty soon you realize, oh, maybe I don't really need all this stuff, you know? Um, there are things you keep for sentimental reasons, you know, photos from when you were young or whatever, but in general, you don't need that stuff underfoot every day out and around. So anyway, that's the stuff dilemma. And then of course guests, you can't have the whole family over, you know, you can't have a dozen friends over. Um, it's pretty compact, depending on the size of the small home you're creating. Um, and I guess I'll just mention there, I mean, the next one is food. There's limited amount of space for storing food and for preparing food. So you may choose to have like foods that are all, all ready to eat. Um, or this is a really good point to, you know, time to mention that really tiny house living um, works better in what you might call an ecosystem that supports it. So in a community like a college campus town, you already have all these students, thousands of students who are basically living in dorms, which are like tiny houses. So there's a bunch of coffee shops, there's a bunch of laundromats, a bunch of restaurants, there's like all this stuff set up for people that are 
almost like homeless. I mean, they've got like this little room that they live in, but basically, if they're hanging out with friends, it's a coffee shop. If they're doing their laundry, it's at the laundromat. If they're exercising, it's not at home. They don't have room for a home gym, so they're going to the gym. So there are these communities like that where you can pretty much bring in a tiny house and live in the tiny house, and then when you need to meet with friends or go get food or whatever, go to the gym, all that stuff's within like a few blocks. Okay, so that's different than let's say you live in maybe Detroit or I don't know, some city where you pretty much like have to drive your car for an hour just to get anything. Um, and so you, you really would want to have more stuff at home because you don't want to drive your car every day to the grocery store or whatever, you know? So in, in larger cities where things are spread out and there's like suburbia, it's kind of hard then to live in a tiny space because you need to stock up stuff basically. At least that's, that's my thinking on it. And then wardrobe, you know, you won't have some simple clothing, you don't have a lot of room to store clothes. The amenities are limited, you know, that would be a challenge, I guess. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it's illegal to live in a tiny house like this if you have electricity hooked up, water hooked up, wastewater hooked up. Um, those things are all not permitted. It's considered to be like an RV, so you can do it for maybe a month, but any longer than that, the city has the right to give you some trouble, and housing code's also an issue. Um, and then I'll just mention, since we're talking about the challenges and housing code, that most cities allow for 700 square feet or larger. And that is still super small. The average American home is 2,400 square feet. So 1,000 square feet, 700 square feet, that's pretty small. And as you've discovered, you're designing your floor plan, you know, the bare minimum of what you'd want in a home, if it's going to be two people or maybe you know, two parents and three kids or some dogs or whatever. Um, think about, you, you'd want a kitchen, you'd want a place to eat, and maybe you could combine that with a living room, you need a place to sleep, um, and then you need your bathroom, you know? So at least those spaces, kitchen, bathroom, sleep, eating, it's like the basic functions of life. So unless you have something within a quick bike ride away where you can go eat or you know, use a, a gym, let's say that's you go to the gym in the morning and you work out and you shower there. You know, there are ways you can outsource it, but if you're not doing that outsourcing, you basically need those spaces, and it's it's really difficult to get it into something much smaller than 700 square feet without getting really creative. So what I tell people is, if you want to be within the law, you know, go ahead and design something that's 700 square feet, and you can put that on a foundation in most cities, and, and you're good to go. You just can't move it easily, right? Anyway, um, Here's an example of how like the kitchen was very downsized. You can see some tiny plates there, this kitchen sink. The water is refillable containers in the back, so you use that for brushing your teeth, washing your hands, uh, cleaning dishes, etc. And you know, you think of these tiny houses as being so like free and easy and just travel wherever you want. Um, that's not my Ford F-250 with the 7.3 diesel engine there. Um, that was somebody else who was helping me move it. I was having an open house and I took it downtown. But basically, you know, you're gonna need like a serious truck, either own one or be able to borrow one or have a friend with one to be able to move these houses around. They're not built with lightweight materials. So that's kind of an issue. You know, you think of them as being portable. You know, they're, they're movable, but not very easily, you know? Um, so the benefits that I found of tiny living and particularly being off the grid was it's super quiet. You don't have fans going, you don't have the furnace, you don't, don't have your air conditioner making noise. There's like, there's no noise. Like unless you're making the noise, there's no noise. Um, easy to clean and I don't know if you can see in the picture here, but it's shiny wood, smooth floor. So, you know, get out of room, it takes like three minutes per week to clean the house, you know. Um, inexpensive to build and to own and to repair. Everything's kind of small scale, so it's a fraction of the cost. Uh, very efficient to heat and to cool, you know. Um, in, in this picture on the right there, you can see there's a heater, and it's a heater from a boat. It's a, it's a heater that's designed for a boat cabin where you have a very small enclosed space. So that's what a tiny house is, very much like a boat cabin. So this heater, just the natural flow of the hot air rising pulls more air in through a tube. So you're getting fresh cold air in the wintertime that's, that's actually going past the hot air tube, so it's preheating that air. So by the time the air gets into the house and into the combustion chamber, it's already pretty hot, and then it exhausts it again, so it creates this little cycle going, and that little boat heater is just super efficient. I was using one of those gas tanks like you'd have on your 
um, grill outdoors. That's what I had hooked up to heat the house. and would go for like a month on that. So very cool. Um, so these homes are more sustainable. It's more realistic to say, hey, I'm going to get a solar panel and I'm going to light my home with LED lights. That works. If you have a 3,000 square foot home, you're going to need a lot of solar panels to heat, you know, to provide electricity for heat and cooling and lighting and everything. And in a tiny house, I think you tend to be perhaps more social because you have to get out of the house to do anything, you know. Um, and then this idea of outsourcing. You can go to the gym, go to the laundromat, all these spaces, the cost and care of those, like the gym, you don't have to worry about your exercise equipment. There's somebody else maintaining that exercise equipment. Everything else, it's just you're spending a lot less time worrying about stuff. Um, one thing I'll point out that's kind of nice in a tiny house is if you have windows on all four sides, which would be your door, of course, would have to have glass in it, um, and then windows on, on all the other walls, you get light pretty much throughout the day, and you get light from all the different angles, and you can see through those windows, which creates a more spacious experience. So if you were in a tiny room in an apartment, you're, you're not going to have windows on all four walls. You'd be lucky to have windows maybe on one wall. Um, so you're going to get a lot more natural light. You're going to get a lot, lot less of a claustrophobic feeling. You can even see in this picture here, I have a window on my right, a window in front of me, light coming in from the door in the front. So there's light coming in from all over. Um, and that's the desk area. And then this is actually two pictures. On the left is a closet where the shirts just hang up going straight back. And then there's that visual again of the heater. And then um, when I'm giving these public talks, I have a list of things that I probably won't spend a lot of time on right now, but just kind of what I'm doing right now is basically trying to promote the small house movement um, by working with media, journalists, small house builders, dwellers, bloggers, website owners, authors, architects, <coughs> public speaking, um, local groups, pocket neighborhoods, tiny house communities, local chapters, and small house society. And you might have noticed I skipped, but it's the most important one there is higher education and K-12. to It's really exciting for me that people in school are studying this now. You know, 15 years later, it's actually curriculum at the, in universities. I get calls from graduate students overseas. You know, it's, it's like a serious topic of study. So I just think that's, that's really cool. So I'm happy to help in all those different areas. And it's just to kind of, it's already growing organically anyway, to kind of help nudge it along or do what I can. Um, and then I'm going to close here with some slides on, oh, is there a question? Uh, well, go ahead. Why don't you finish up and then there's some questions. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm just going to show you a couple of slides here. Uh, the tiny house companies, there's Jay Schaefer. He now has Four Lights Tiny House Company. He started this tumbleweed tiny house company and sold that. And he's working on a tiny house village in Sonoma County, I think it is. Pocket neighborhoods would be something to get online and research a little bit. But this is a concept that was developed by Ross Chapin, and it's pocket-neighborhoods.net. But the idea is that you build some, not like garden sheds, but more like maybe 500, 700 square feet, and then have people share a garden, share a yard, etc. cetera. Um, and here's a group in Iowa City, and that's the Small House Society webpage there. And, oh, and then there was a tour we did from Canada to Mexico, kind of introducing people to tiny houses. There's Jay and Dee Williams and tiny house workshops. Here's people lining up in the streets just to see a tiny house. I'm kind of skipping quickly because I want to get to questions. There's a workshop group of people learning how to build tiny houses. Well, this was fun. This was on that trip from Canada to Mexico. Stop at Google. <laughs> so I just thought that was a cool picture. Um, and there's events, there's conferences now across the nation you can go, and there are hundreds of people that show up to talk about tiny houses at these jamborees, and uh, there we go. So I hope that was okay to kind of go through it quick, because I think you'll all have some good questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, sure. Yeah. Julia? All right. Uh, I have two questions. So um, my first question is that isn't I feel like the tiny house you're more describing is more like a cabin. So um, how do people make, is there more modernized like tiny houses that are out there in certain communities like that they have more technology implemented and stuff? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Because really, even though the modern tiny house movement that began recently with houses on wheels that, that look like traditional homes, there have been tiny houses for a long time. And you mentioned it, like cabins, log cabins. And many of these homes were by necessity small because they wanted to keep the heat in and all that. They didn't uh, want to spend a lot of time building a huge home. But the pioneers who were building homes. But yes, to answer your question, there are some really modern looking, very modern, ultra modern, tiny houses that are made out of aluminum and metal and glass and have all kinds of smart home technology. In fact, um, I can send some links to your teacher there and he can share with you. There, there are some that are just amazing. Like you control the whole house with your phone uh, and it, it automatically adjusts things, yeah. I would love that, yeah. Uh, send those links to me, thanks, Greg. Another question, okay. please, oh, Anna? Um, how much did it, did it cost to make your 70 square foot small home? So that one, the materials um, were, I think, about 15,000. Um, and I should mention also with that that we chose mostly new materials, although some repurposed, like the door and the windows, and there were some things that were reused. But a lot of it was new, and so that meant it was purchased at retail, it was expensive. So you could probably save on materials in that way. Also, we went with solid cedar wood siding um, and really nice, thick uh, stainless steel surfaces that we had to bend manually, you know, bend those to fit them in. <clears throat> so a lot of really expensive materials. And then maybe another 5000 let's say, for like labor um, cost as well. So about twenty thousand dollars for that house. Daria? Um, if you're unable to work with um, with electricity and all that, how would you be able to work with electronics? So you know, a lot of electronics um, are battery powered, and what I would do during the time that I was living in that tiny house, I was working at the University of Iowa, and I guess regardless of where I was working, I would be plugging in my cell phone or maybe, you know, I have my laptop computer with me plugging it in. So these devices that are electronics with batteries, you can charge those up elsewhere. You can also have a solar panel that charges a battery. And usually you imagine solar panels being on top of roofs, but often you want your roof shaded because you don't want the house to be hot. So you want your house shaded, that's good. Maybe you put this solar panel somewhere out in the front yard or the backyard or some place where you can get a lot of sunlight on that solar panel and charge up the battery. Um, but yeah, there, there are different ways you can get um, electricity in the house without having to be on, plugged in. Bashir? Um, was your house always uh, like onto a truck or did you always have to uh, put it onto a truck when you wanted to go somewhere? Well, with mine, I didn't have a truck, so I'd have to put it on the truck to get it somewhere. Was that the question? Yeah, I think, though, uh, he must. He might not have seen that it was on a trailer. And oh, the, yeah. The truck some, of these, the some of the homes are on what's called skids, and that saves like $3,000 on the cost, because if a house is on skids, it means there's like these wooden runners on the bottom of it. And to move it around, you would you would lift it up onto a flatbed truck, and then it would be on the back of that truck, and you'd haul it around, and then when you get to where you're going, you would tilt the truck like this, you'd slide the house off, and just let it sit right on the dirt or on a slab of cement. But with the ones that have trailers, then you hook them up to a truck and pull them around that way. Go ahead. How much money would it cost to make it a tiny house out of mostly recycled materials? I've heard people have numbers like $4,000, $5,000 maybe, and they just get everything that's recycled, things that get donated, things that are being thrown away, the scraps of things and fill that way. So you can save a lot, especially if you're building it yourself. Um, I've got a question. Um, kids are always thinking about money, and so are people, so are adults, but, and I've seen comparisons. Um, but what are some of the anecdotal stories that you've run across where people have saved a lot of money and do great things like travel and other things that they would not have been able to do had they bought a big, huge, two 2,500 square foot home? Oh yeah, that's a good question. And you know, that's part of what motivates people to get these tiny houses is you figure, 
you're going to end up spending maybe you know 700 a month for rent or maybe more maybe less depending on where you live and what you want um, but that's money that could go to other things so if you combine your house payment let's just use the number 700 for convenience and then a car payment with all the maintenance and insurance and gas money and all that um, just sort of those are two big life expenses right there you could easily spend a thousand dollars on those two items so if you don't have those two items it, to worry about if you build your house and it's paid for now you don't have any housing rent or mortgage and you don't have a car payment well now you have about a thousand dollars left over every month so think of what you could do for a thousand dollars a month or twelve thousand dollars a year saved up you know any other questions um, sir? Uh, it looks, yeah. Okay. Um, my other question was, do you think that house that tiny houses have the actual potential to like go mainstream? Because I know a lot of people in like communities like Portland are able to do that because they're just a couple or something, and they're willing to just devote some of their time to build a tiny house. But do you think it has the potential to go worldwide and more like mainstream? Yeah, that's a really good question because um, in some respects, I think it can and it's starting to become really mainstream because as I mentioned earlier, people just don't have the need for space. And so whether it's a tiny house on wheels or if it's one of these you know, 500 square foot condos that's half a million dollars or, or anything in between, um, yeah, I, I think it can go mainstream. Here's the challenge though. Inevitably, if you're looking at savings on you know saving costs for building something or energy savings or environmental protection or whatever if you think about the efficiency of an apartment it's like all these little apartments that are in this building right those apartments are all sharing a wall they're sharing a floor they're sharing a ceiling so like the distributed cost of that is much less per person now if, there, if there's a landlord and they're charging a lot of money in rent and, you know you're, you're still going to have some expense there um, but still, my point is that a tiny house on its own, you have to cover the full expense of your roof, your walls, your floor, you have to cover the full expense of your land, and then think about like a thousand people in tiny houses on a thousand little plots of land, that's going to take up a lot of land. I mean, maybe that's a good level of, of density, you know, for the environment, who knows, but I'm just saying that's going to take up a lot of land, whereas you can probably get a thousand people living in an apartment and it would take up very little land. So there's there's kind of some trade-offs to be realistic about. But in general, I think the lower density tiny houses, it's a good idea. But then the other thing to think about is people who are your age and then going on up to people who are in college and people who are just out of college, that's like millions of people that don't have a lot of stuff generally and they don't have a lot of things to worry about. So they can live in a small house or Think about the other end of it, it's like people who are retired, and the person that's retired, maybe they've gotten rid of their stuff and they're just living very simply. So really it's people who are kind of up to the age of like 22, 25, it's still pretty easy to live in a tiny house, and then people that are kind of pretty much giving away all their stuff by the time they're you know, 50, 60 years old and they're going to live a simple retired life, they can live in a tiny house. But the people in between, those people in this middle area, they have two dogs, two cats, a parakeet, three kids, the two parents, maybe their grandparents are living at home. It's like seven people living in one house, so the tiny house isn't gonna work as much for them. But I think it can really, really become mainstream for younger people, for older people, and then anybody who throughout their life is able to maintain a career and just a situation where they could, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, just live simple and live in a tiny house. So um, it's just, there are gonna be challenges for larger families. Maybe maybe someone needs to come up with um, uh, a tiny home that is able to connect to another tiny home in multiple ways. Yeah, like those container homes or something. Yeah. They could just expand and then get smaller as you want. Any any further questions, any final questions? We got one over here again yet. Um, how long would it take to build a tiny house? How long would it take to build a tiny house? There are people who they have it all planned out and they think it's going to take three months, you know, like usually you see these videos on YouTube with a couple 
that are in their 20s, you know, they're going to build this house. And then it ends up taking like two years, you know, or <laughs> it takes like a year. So the, the one I built with Jay working pretty much every day on it took a couple of months. Um, and that was like a small house with, in many respects, very simple. So, you know, you can save some money there on labor and on materials um, because of the size. But I guess the, the factor to look at in terms of how much time it takes and how much money it takes is that whatever you're building, um, the cost per square foot is usually about 100 to 150 dollars you can say for construction. So the only reason a tiny house costs less is just because there's less cost, there's there's less square feet for your cost per square foot, so the, the total is lower. But in general, the materials have the same cost, takes the same amount of time per square foot to build. There is a little more density. So you saw in the tiny house that I showed you in the pictures, there's like cabinets and shelves and tables and all this stuff going on. So there's a lot of materials in a very small confined space. So there your cost per square foot goes up just because it's not like having one big empty living room, you know? We're, we're pretty much out of time here. In 60 seconds or less, any inspirational words to these young kids? Oh, I, I think that you know, each person is going to find what works for them best. It's excellent that you're actually thinking about these things because materials can really, the material things, the stuff, can just slow down your life, hinder your life, clutter your life, make you less efficient. It's stuff that you got to figure out where you're going to put it. You're going to have to dust it, clean it, um, and then at some point, you know, give it away. So if you can kind of keep your life decluttered and simplified and focus on the things you enjoy, whether it's skateboarding or music or photography or whatever, it's a real good practice and, and you'll really be surprised how it positively can impact your life. Well, we thank you so, so much for your time. Um, we're very grateful for your knowledge and your experience and, and that you were willing to share it with um, the kids here. So. Thanks so much, and um, I I've recorded this. I'll put this up on our YouTube channel, and I'll let you all. I'll let you know. Okay. That'd be great. I'd love to link to it. I can share it with others. So. Thanks, Greg. Have a great day. All right. You too. Take care. Thanks, everybody.